All right, so reviewing everything we did in class uh, might start us off at kind of a funny place right here in week two. I'm going to do that because I feel like everyone's got printing pretty well down pat, like y'all are fine on that. So uh, uh, week two, what we started with, and it's not computer science principles, it's computer science A. But anyway, uh, we just went in through variables, the different kinds. So I'm going to open up Dr. Java here, and we're going to go ahead and make up a new uh, class for that. Right. So we've typed this out probably a hundred times, but I've never really explained too much about it. When we started doing methods, I explained that this was a method and that this is just simply the method that we start coding in, but I haven't explained this, although now with arrays we should know what this is. And I haven't really explained the public, the word public. There are two options for public. It's public and private. What they are called are things called visibility. And what really makes them different, um, for instance, if I had a public uh, void uh, method print out, and it just simply printed out whatever string it was given, I know, we're, we're doing variables, and we're going to get into those soon. What the fact that it's public affects how another uh, another public class, another uh, code, another file could actually call it. For instance, watch this. As I get all this in here, right now, since they're in the same folder, and this is a public method, I can go ahead and do print out uh, hello. And you'll see, oh, yes, uh, call it that. All right, so you can see how I'll call it like that, and it'll work, right? Run, it'll say hello, because that's what printout does. And if I were to add on to printout, we can see this um, right here. We can see that printout will still work exactly how it exists in review.java, even though I'm in another review.java. And that's because this is a public method that is uh, stored here. Now, if it were private, if it were a private method, all of a sudden we get an error saying that um, printout is not accessible. So public allows us to use it across different files. While we have not done very much of this, though we do start to do it with uh, sequential and binary sorts. We don't have it done, uh, we, well, it's a good practice to go ahead and start, and there's not a lot of reason to make it private right now. So we're still working with public uh, methods. And that's just simply what visibility is. So you'll notice right there, already I've used a variable. Even just showing a small little example of something else, you'll notice that variables are still very much a part of it. So really, I would say a lot of um, what we do in Java is based upon variables. In fact, in a certain way, we are making this is, well, never mind, another time. Uh, no matter what, we are always going to be dealing with variables. And in AP Computer Science, we usually deal with uh, these specific ones. Uh, because these are why there we go. Because these are actually the required ones to know about for uh, Java. All right. Now to understand them, and I know we're going really basic with this one, but that'll definitely help anyone who's uh, struggling. You understand that in the computer there is a thing called RAM. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. I'm just going to size nice. Random Access Memory. This is different from your normal hard drive memory because it, one, is faster, and two, 
it's smaller. Typically, for instance, this laptop only has a uh, RAM size of yeah, probably about eight gigabytes, even though it's got you know, over a hundred gigabytes of hard drive space. But RAM is used because it's much uh, quicker than hard drives are. So there's this part in the computer, actually probably two parts of these little RAM sticks. I'll just write RAM here. And they're attached into in the inside of your computer. And whenever you make a new variable, you know, like an integer, X, and we'll just say we're declaring it. That's called declaring. Let me just say that it exists. It makes a little spot on the um, on that RAM card, the right size for the variable type. The variable type is indicated before the name of the variable the first time it is declared. After that, whenever that uh, variable is uh, assigned a value, and the first time it's assigned a value, it's called initialization. After that, we just call it assignment. Every time it is uh, it is uh, assigned, or every time it is used, it is working with that little space in memory right there. As long as it is still inside the same method, uh, you will remember when we passed it uh, a string. Well, it's actually a bad example. We'll say we'll talk about why it's a bad example another time. But let's say I put int x in here instead. It was print out with int x, and I reopened another review and passed it uh, four. In that case, I'm actually special for the x equals four. Do this. The x that is being passed, it is uh, passing the value of it there. It's not actually passing that space in memory. The importance of that of understanding that is one, if I were to go into here and say, okay, x equals seven, you know, changing the variable, oops, it's not actually changed up here. You'll see that if I printed out x over here, it's still just four as it was here. It hasn't changed to seven like how we did it here because in here we are changing a different space in memory. When we pass a variable through a method, pass it as an argument, we say, it makes a brand new space in memory of the same size. So that is actually a different thing. Uh, that is one of the special things to understand about it is that what, uh, it is it, all of them are stored on RAM and our primitive data types here they are passed by value, as in only the value that was in that spot is given, meaning that if you try to change x from inside there, you will only change it within this method. You do not change it in the original place that passed it to you. If you wanted to change a variable, you would change the, the return type here from void, which means nothing because there is no return in here, to actually returning the data type that you want to return. In this case, since I want to return x, because that's what I typed here, it should be an integer form. Meaning, while it still does not change it, if I were to say, hey, x equals, yeah, then you'll notice it actually does change to 7. Because we passed it as 4, it prints it out as 4, it makes its local x equal to 7, and it returns that value back here, which get, then gets assigned to this x. And that is how you would actually change the value. Understand from that little uh, run through, we had a return type. We had variables declared both within the parentheses of a method. These things are called parameters. Hopefully you can remember that because they're parentheses, so parameters. And we also saw it as a local variable made between the brackets. Most of them, you'll probably do it between the brackets, especially at this basic of a level. So the four different types of variables that we deal with in AP most frequently are string, integer, double, and boolean. Boolean is probably the one that you'd want to notice the, the easiest. If you were to say if... Uh, let's say first we just said, okay, if x is equal to 3, 
you know x is equal to 3, right? So you should know that this would pass, that, pass true, right? Now, what if I just wrote the word true in here? Well, you notice how it turns blue. True is actually, true and false are actually special values that are the same as if you were checking um, an actual condition. So this is the same thing as saying, as actually checking two numbers that are equal. Whereas false is the same thing as checking two numbers that are not equal, right? Because you know three is not equal to four. So if I just say true, it'll also print true. Now, this is the conditional statement. And it works pretty closely with these Booleans. So much so that I can even give it a Boolean variable that is set equal to true, and it will be just the same, same as saying true, because it is true, right? So hopefully you can see me using these variables, even if we haven't yet reviewed if statements, which is what we'll do next. So far, hope you're feeling okay. Sorry, let's keep it going. This, these if statements are uh, called conditionals. And the big thing about them is that they uh, compare conditions. They are they are checking if two things are maybe the same, x and y. Now notice, even though x and y are different data types, integer and double are kind of special that they can still uh, work together. And you can see how 3 and 3.0 are the same value. Now, firstly, for a lot of you, that doesn't seem confusing at all. Because, yeah, of course, 3 and 3.0 are the same thing. Understand that this is actually kind of special and it's kind of nice of Java to do. Uh, there are other times where it, they won't be able to play together as easily, but a lot of things will. For instance, one thing where you can't have it play together as easily is going from uh, if, as if you were to do something like this. Now notice there's no error on this line. y equals x is fine. If you try to put an integer value into a double, it will automatically change to double. If you try to put an integer into a double. Now if you try to put um, a, a double into an integer, it actually stops you because that's actually good programming practice to go ahead and cast it to an integer. Remember that casting to an integer means that you put parentheses and then the name of the data type you want it to be in and then put the, the, the value that you want to cast. Casting means you change the variable type, so that way it can go ahead and uh, change this 3.0 into just a 3. It will just ignore. Remember, it doesn't round up, doesn't round down. So that even if it were a 3.8, it would still, um, if it were 3.8, it would still just round down to, to uh, 3. So x is still equal to 3, as you can see, using this condition. And I hope also this way of reviewing the conditional is okay for you. That, you know, it's me using the conditional to test each thing about the variables. Honestly, this is actually for a pretty good reason. So, just in case it was confusing, what I did was I showed how to convert from double to integer. But that integer to double is automatic. And that you can compare to uh, an integer and a double together rather Easily. You can still compare them, but it might have some problems. For instance, you notice right there when I did 3.8 with x, it's fine, except that it does recognize 3 and 3 being the same, and it just ignores the fact that y has that 3.8 behind it. So you might have to be a little bit more. Um, uh, you, might, you might have to just be a little more deliberate. Pay attention to it. Make sure they actually do want to check it. One thing you might do is not compare these two together, 
perhaps what you do is make a second um, x that just holds the value of it, and then you can compare the two uh, much more easily. Compare 3.8 and 3.2, and that would change how you would uh, compare those. Oh, yeah. Just, uh, yeah, that's why, because I changed it back to 3. You can see now, now that's comparing x to the double of x and y, and I'm not changing y back into 3, it's still 3.8. 3.8 and 3 are not the same. Okay, so the conditional being used to test each of the variables, the whole point of that is that conditionals are really good for those testing. And I want you to test your program as much as possible. Compile it, make sure it can. Run it to see if it's doing what you expect. So let's keep going. I want to show something else now. We're going to work with the string and the conditional. And you know that, um, well, one, perhaps you remember, I don't know. Uh, you hopefully remember that if we have just one line below the if statement, then it will work fine on its own. If we have, if we said, you know, one of two lines, wanted to say true twice for whatever reason, this would not work because it doesn't, it needs those brackets to show it where the whole if statement is. But if you just have one if statement, you just have one line below the if statement, then you can actually skip out on having those uh, brackets there. It works just fine. I want to talk about this equals equals. Because while we talked about equals equals being a thing, and we'll go through the others soon, equals equals does not work for strings. Or at least, it's not guaranteed to. We're going to come back to our diagram in a moment. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and comment this out, meaning that it will not run. So I want to show you that it can work. Equals equals can work for strings, but it's not guaranteed. All right, I'm going to stop trying it. Maybe that doesn't make sense. Here's how it's not guaranteed to work and why I always say we need to use that, you know, dot equals. So that's in dot equals or equals ignore case, which remember case is just reference to uh, capital lowercase. So like, you know, I could do the exact opposite even or, you know, just even do all capitals. And even though it's not caps up there, it's fine. It works. So let's talk about why equals equals doesn't necessarily work for strings. Let me clear this off. So when you do a place in memory and you make a new string, you notice that strings are, unlike others, strings are capitalized, aren't they? That, that data type is capitalized. And that's actually important because it's not like the others. It's not like things like, um, you know, like the, uh, like the integer or the double. Instead, when a string is made, it's given its own space. So you want, here's hello. I'm trying to make that a little smaller so it can fit in this little box I made for it. And then when we make another string, let's say we want to compare it with hello. We are back to that equals equals idea. It, it could do one of two things. One, this is not one way it could go. When we compare it with if str equals equals hello, if we were to do that, it could make a second string in memory for just a moment, even though we didn't make a new variable, it just has to make another space in memory for just a moment, so that way it can compare them. And what it's going to do is, it won't compare the actual values of the two of them. It'll instead compare the addresses. What are addresses? Addresses are little, uh, uh, little uh, places to, where they're the locations of the variables in memory, the variables and the values in this case. And it will look at those two addresses and say, hey, are those two addresses alike? 1010101 and 1101011. These are just things I made up. But are these two addresses the same? 
No, they are not. Now, so it's not guaranteed to work. You, that's, that's one way it could, it could fail. If it makes a new space in memory uh, that has a different address, then it will not, then this equals equals will not work. But if it makes a smart move, which it usually will, but won't always, and just simply refers back to the same string, it, it will actually go ahead and consider them the same because this is actually in the same address as this one. It won't make a new variable space for it. It'll just use this one because what it does is when you make this hello here, it says, okay, let me look through the rest of the program and see if I already have a variable with that space, with that value. And it sees that it does. So in that case, it doesn't make a new space in memory. It just simply uses the old one. So equals equals can work for strings, but I'm going to advise you not to do it. I'm going to advise you to always use the equals ignore case. That would wrap up our discussion on strings and on if statements, because I'm just going to keep using those if statements. So hopefully you're feeling all right about that. About 21 minutes in. Okay. Let's take a look at week three. Let me remind myself what we have for week three. Um, we're going to skip recursion for now. Okay, week three we started dealing with, um, with uh, let's see, what is this? With uh, string methods. So let's talk about these string methods. No, I didn't mean to open Spotify. There's a really good one for use for uh, examining this, and it was from the Magpie lab. And it was the string explorer. So let's take a look at this string explorer. You got all the basic variable types down and you know how to use if statements. But we are still to cover our string methods, uh, loops, and arrays. And then we'll try and get, um, if anyone has trouble still with recursion, um, hopefully we can get that one on one at some point. All right, so. String explorer, string arrays. Let's take a look at this index of method. That was really kind of the heart of MacBond. So we have a sample for a string, uh, a, a sample string uh, with this is our text. Many of you might know this one because it's often used in typing exercises because it includes every letter of the alphabet. So let's go ahead and look at index of door. Index of, we say in the uh, reading, we say index of has two versions. One, where it just returns the very first index of a certain string. Two, where it returns the first index of a certain string after a certain index. So let's talk about that. Let's take a look at, I'm just going to get rid of the rest of this. Let's take a look at what happens if we say quick. The index of quick. So notice I'm using the the name of my variable sample dot index of the variable the methods I, method I want to use, and I'm using the one that just takes one string. There's another one where I can go ahead and put in an index, but then we'll look at that next. For now. For now, let's take a look at this. If I get the index of quick, it's going to go ahead and get that and then save it into this. Now that's only because I have an integer position all set up. You'll notice that the index is full. And we can see this because if we go pretend that this is index 0, because it is, and this is index 1, index 2, index 3, index 4. So this whole word is present starting at index 4. So that is what index of returns. Now if I were to add in an additional um, uh, a value here, let's say this, uh, this, uh, this integer, well what happens then is it does what's called a substring. 
it's almost as if starting, it's almost as if a sample has been changed from index to only be index five onwards. So it's like it, this first part is gone. So when that happens, it's going to search for the word quick, but only from this spot onwards. And you'll notice that that means it's not actually, oops. Oh, yeah. that's not actually present in the uh, in in this highlighted part of the string because again it's only going to search from index five onwards. In that case, in any case where it um, is not able to find the value, because in this case it won't, it's going to be negative one. The same thing would have happened if I tried to search for something that wasn't present in there, like that. You'll notice that this is not present in that string. Therefore, it would also be negative one. So whether it's searching from, whether because we substringed it out and are only searching the part that doesn't include it, or when we're searching for something that is legitimately just not in there at all, it's going to say negative one. And the reason is because while zero is a valid index, negative one isn't. Negative one is not an index in a string at all. So it's guaranteed uh, that you would never have negative one if the string was present in the bigger string. And so index of, whether this version or this version, will always return a negative one if it cannot find the string you were looking for. To take on another string method, let's take care at. If I wanted to go ahead and figure out what um, what character was at I don't know, 10, it would work like this. And now watch what I do here. I do this plus sign, which is called concatenation. And you can see it on the other ones, but concatenation. Concatenation is where you combine two strings or a string with any other variable type together. For instance, when I took position and I added it in there, that was concatenating the string with the integer to put it all together to print out together. In this case, I'm going to actually skip out using the integer position, and I'm just going to write the method, the method uh, itself. Because that method returned care at returns a character at that location. And I don't actually have to save that into any other variable. If I were to save it into a variable, I would make a new care. I know that is not that is not one of our standard AP CSA variable types, but it is a valid variable type, and we will revisit it when we deal with arrays. So when I get the care that is at of the character that is at 10, index 10 of this, of the original string, you'll notice it says it is B. And we can confirm this. Because T is at 0, H is at 1, E is at 2, and this is 3, so follow along with the highlighter. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. B is the character at 10. So that is character at and index of so far. Two lowercase and two uppercase. I mean, I hope you can get the idea of how to use this. It's just two uppercase. And I guess one thing I should mention is, besides that, uh, is that if I were to do this and then print out sample, maybe you would expect it to print out uppercase, but that is not what's going to happen. You notice how it's still normal? And that's not because of anything special. It's just because um, to uppercase actually doesn't change string when it's passed. It's passing, uh, it's a little like when we had this passing the X and it didn't change it until we returned it. It's because, yeah, it's not actually changing sample. When, it go, when, we, um, when we use this method with it. Notice I'm not passing it sample, but since I am calling it through sample, to uppercase method, which is located in the string API, um, is just going through each letter and changing it to an uppercase letter. So that if I did that, 
it would change the variable and pr and then when we print it out it would actually be big yelling uppercase to lowercase does the same thing except you know lower case instead of uppercase not too bad all right and just like the caret method this could have instead been like this in which case this one wins it's going to make it uppercase although if i were to print it out a second time it will still be lowercase so i guess that's something i should point out remember how we said without the equal sign it doesn't actually change it well notice there's no equal sign here right so while it will print it out as two uppercase just like how that printed out the character at it it was still the original lowercase um, uh, value because we never actually set sample equal to two uppercase we said equal to two lowercase so it keeps it even when we use one of these methods on it moving on length is special and we'll come back to it trim is honestly pretty easy uh, watch this is all the, this is all it really is str it's so rare that trim shows up it is actually kind of weird that we do it in AP but why not it's still a pretty simple concept and to be fair there probably are plenty of places out in the world where they will use it I just didn't experience them myself so what does trim do well let's 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 see what trim uh, without trim what that is like and we'll compare them so the last two lines of our output are going to be str without trim and then str with trim and actually I'll put it the other way around so with trim without trim because remember if we just do dot it doesn't change it we have to do the equals so with with trim without trim yeah see all these spaces at the beginning you probably wondered why I did that it's to show what trim does trim removes the beginning and ending spaces from the string and so it just so in this case where we didn't say it equals it just removes it from the output it didn't change the original variable but that's what trim does removes beginning removes what we call uh, trailing and leading white space it's okay so uh, it does not remove it from in between words so you know if I have these words in here it will not get rid of these spaces even though they look weird and funny it won't fix that up so if you were hoping that if you you know wrote a sentence like uh, Cthulhu is pretty and then you actually put in like two spaces right there it's not gonna remove those spaces I know it'd be kind of nice if something did that and it would return it to sentence looking uh, spacing but it's not going to do that for you okay. but it will do is get rid of the beginning and ending spaces if there are any if there are not any then it will just it'll look the same with trim or without trim because there's nothing to trim so that's all that is and the reason why we used it in magpie was because we were checking what the user said so we got something from the user you can ignore what I'm doing up there the scanners aren't exactly on the test but alright here str equals input dot next remember that dot next gets the next um, thing from input and stores it in whatever you said it equal whatever you assign it to on the left here so in that case um, if uh, the whole point of it was that if str dot, uh, dot equals the empty string if the user didn't say anything on one of the times that magpie one of the times that magpie was asking for uh, input but the user didn't say anything it was supposed to say hey please say something right hopefully you remember that so hopefully um, you know, when they're like, please say something, I beg of you. So if if it's the empty string, then you just, you want the okay. You know, so if it's just an empty string, 
which uh, it's kind of hard to do. Why is okay? That was kind of weird. Uh, yeah. So if it was just an empty string, uh, we'll worry about that later. Pretend that didn't happen, because I think something's going wrong with my editor, and I'd rather not stress it out right now. All right. So if it was the empty string, it was supposed to say, you know, please say something. But that wouldn't have happened if, you know, I just put a bunch of spaces in, right? Which, again, this is weird why it's doing that. Uh, I guess it's just our way of getting next. Yeah. All right. Uh, not something that happened in Magpie. But anyway. Uh, so if it was just spaces, it wasn't it was supposed to say anything. So it's supposed to say that. And the way to handle that is to go ahead and do str equals str dot trim because then you remove all those spaces. So even if you, they put in spaces, it would just get rid of them and be like, okay, they didn't say anything. But that is trim from Magpie, which works better in the context of Magpie. All right, so that's pretty much everything for uh, stream methods. And again, we're coming back to length uh, with loops. So let's take a look at that. How long, how far in are we? 36 minutes? We can do this. Week five. Week five. This is week five and six. Let's see. Iterations is what we dealt with. And if you haven't done this reading, I highly recommend it. Also, I did make a quick reader for it. And that was with what? So iterations awesome. And what the quick reader is, is if you download those files from eCampus, this is going to be weird. It's me recording me on a recording of me. Download those files from eCampus, the iterations and random as text, and the thing for um, for quick main. You would run the quick main application, use it to open up, set it to whatever rate you wanted, use it to read your iterations and random as text, and it would start reading for you. And as long as you're very fluent in English and in all the words that are popping up, you can change that rate to be as high as you like and it works really well because your eyes don't have to move across the page so it would actually cut down on your reading by a lot I turned all this into text you're welcome and you can do that with any class really any subject you want to study and just read quickly in fact I've done um, I've done that myself sometimes when I'm just uh, studying some stuff online and I want to get through it quickly and I know I know the subject or at least I know I know the language well enough um, I just put it into the quick main and if there's something that I uh, mess up on, I can hit the show contents button. So that's just a little plug for something of mine that I developed. All right, so the required reading was about uh, iterations, if uh, loops particularly. Now let's, let's take a look at these loops that we went through in class. Both that, that, and that. All three of them, I guess. Uh, we already did a, uh, a lecture with those. I've checked those lectures on eCampus. But just to go through it from what it was in the reading, there are a few parts of a loop. For the while loop and the for loop, they both have these um, these conditions inside them. So, for instance, let's say that for a while loop, we had uh, we were simulating a restaurant. So, uh, at a restaurant, you know, a waiter comes over. And he's going to sprinkle, pa uh, what is it sprinkle? Probably Parmesan. Parmesan onto your food. It's been a while since my mouth. Anyway, Parmesan onto your food, right? So he's doing that, and he's like, all right, tell, tell me when to stop. In fact, he usually just says, tell me when. So we're simulating that here. While the person has not said when, the, person keep, the, the, the waiter keeps uh, grating cheese. So as, let's just say we, we're saying nothing. You know, we'll just say zero. It's going to keep grading as long as we haven't said when. That's what's happening on this line. What it is, is there's actually two parts here. And I might go ahead and parenthesis this out so you can see it a little easier. If command dot equals when, well, that's a true or false statement, right? We're checking to see if command is equal to win. And if it is equal to win, or actually we'll start with if it's not, for instance, if I say not win, or just not, 
it's going to look at it and say, is command equal to win? No. So that is the same as saying false. Then this exclamation mark here is not. So it's the opposite of that. Not false is the same as saying true and spelling it correctly. So when I have this not command dot equals win, that's basically the same thing as saying when command does not equal win, we are going to continue grading cheese until finally I say win and then we stop. Notice it hasn't asked for my input anymore. So that's the basic of a while loop and that's the basic of the exclamation mark. You've also seen this when we did things in class like if x is not equal to 4, which is kind of like asking if, uh, kind of like the other inequality operators. Uh, all of these are, in, are called inequality operators where, you know, not equal to, greater than, less than. They only happen if x is not equal to 4 or if it is greater than 4 or is less than 4. And I have to tell you, with this structure right here, these two will never happen because they are else. So they only happen if the previous if statements have not occurred. And if it's not equal to 4, well, if it's greater than 4, it's not equal to 4. If it's less than 4, it's not equal to 4. So in those cases, it would still, um, it would do this one instead. But that's just a side note. Hopefully you can get that. But mainly once you get this loop. So these loops. You can ask me about this part if you have a question about that part. All right, so the loops, that is how a while loop works. It's best when we're doing things like this. Or we can do the other way of command uh, dot equals ignore case with or without the ignore case. Um, stop rating cheese, which is going to have to be next line. And again, if you forget what that means, ask me in class or email. So if it's stop grading cheese, x doesn't exist, and that was what the problem it had with that line. So it's okay, going to keep. Oops. <laughs> Ooh. Keep We're going to go as long as I keep saying keep grading, this waiter here is going to keep grading the cheese. So, so that's another thing. Command is equal to nothing right now, right? So while it is equal to that, well, it's not equal to that because it's equal to that. So I have to make it equal to that on, on the very start. And that's why that wasn't running. Okay. So it's grading, and I say, hey, keep grading. Keep grading, keep grading, keep grading. Uh, literally anything else stops. And that's while. While is a loop. It's kind of like those recursion things we did, but easier. Okay, next, for loop. For is better for dealing with set, um, set ranges. And you'll see this in your table print lab, especially. Uh, let's go and take a look at table print and let's just do a whole thing right now. So, all right, so if I'm dealing with this thing, let's go and just go through the first part of table print together. It's making a variable and then from that gain a, a, a maximum from the user which is what I'm doing so far I know I'm typing a lot not speaking but notice um, notice that I make a new and I'm actually gonna take the photo I make a new variable to hold the maximum because what I'm gonna be doing in this table print lab is I'm going to be printing out using a for loop, which is what we'll go into now. I'm going to printing out uh, asterisks, or actually just the numbers, from 1 all the way up through that maximum that I set. So it means that instead of just printing out the same number each time of something, I can make it based on the user's preference, on the user's input. And let me check my time, 44. Okay, be long. All right, so let's go ahead and do that now. 
to print out 1 through maximum inclusive of all the numbers is this. What I do is I do 4, and then 4 has three pieces inside. The first piece is the initialization or, de and or declaration. I can actually declare a variable inside here. Usually we use the variable i, but you can say counter if you like. Um, I, and I'm going to start it at the beginning of my range. I want all numbers 1 through whatever maximum is. So I'm going to start at 1. I'm going to keep looping as long as counter is less than maximum. And in fact, it says through inclusive. So I'm going to put this equals and not tell you what that means just yet. And I'm going to increment counter by 1 each time. That's actually what this is. This is the same as if saying counter equals counter plus 1. It's just much shorter to write. Same thing as saying that. This is much shorter to write. And this is how a for loop header looks. Got your new variable that you set the value of. You got your conditional that says how long the loop is going to go on for. I'm going to switch back. Remember the while statement? The while structure? It had that condition right here. The for loop is going to have its condition here. And lastly, there's some kind of change. Whereas in the while loop, I'm changing back again. In the while loop, it was between the brackets. You know, we changed commands so that at some point it would no longer be equal to keep grading. Because we ha didn't have that part in there, it would just, you know, it would go on forever. Because, uh, I can ignore that. Uh, because in that case, Grading would never, it would never stop being equal to keep grading. Because there's no point for the user to actually change it. And so the change for while happens right there. The change for for, however, happens here. And notice I'm changing the variable that I'm using to count through the whole way. Now if I print it out as it is, and I'm printing out counter each time. I'll talk about why I'm doing it like this. You'll notice that it prints out. First, the program is going to ask me for my maximum, say so I do 5, and it's going to print out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you can see that because counter starts at 1, checks if 1 is less than or equal to maximum, and it is. 1 is less than maximum, it is less than or equal to 5. It'll print it out. And then it's going to go ahead and increment, increment counter by 1. So if it increments counter by 1, then now counter is equal to 2. Even though it's not written here, it is. It truly is. It's going to check if 2 is less than or equal to 5, and it is. So it prints out 2. Right there. It'll do the same thing for 3, because 2 is going to, counter is going to get plused again, become 3. And even though it's not written there, it is equal to 3. 3 is less than or equal to 5. Hey, it is indeed. So we go in here, we print it out. Then we increment counter by 1 again. See, we're doing this not as we go through the top part, but at the end of the for loop each time. Right here. So right there is where it happens. And it keeps going till it gets to 5. Now we're going to, I mean, it doesn't stop at 5 here, but we're going to say what happens. So let's say it's 4 and now it's 5, so it goes 5. Even though it's not written here, it's 5 now, because we've gone through all the other numbers. So it looks at it, it says 5 is less than or equal to 5. Well, that's true. They're equal. So it prints out counter, which is 5, and then increments it to 6. Now at this point, it goes, okay, 6. Is 6 less than or equal to 5? It is not. So it immediately jumps out and does not print 6. Now, this is where I want to point out the word inclusive. Inclusive means it includes whatever number I put in for maximum, in this case 5. And we did include 5. If I took out the equal sign, it's now what's called exclusive. Exclusive is where we print out all the numbers from, from the lower bound but not the upper bound. So if I did the same 5, it would just do 1, 2, 3, 4, because it's now exclusive, because there's no more equal sign there. That is the big difference.
Now I could also do this by doing equals and then minus one because if we're just doing it through four, less than or equal to four, it's the same thing as if we did less than five. Less than four and less than or equal to five are the same thing. I'm sorry, less than or equal to four and less than five are the same thing. You got that. Now, I could have also done this another way. You notice I said here's where the incrementing and decrementing happens at the end of the loop. Decrementing. Incrementing is go up by one. Decrementing is going down by one. And we don't want to do it in this case because if I try to go one and keep subtracting by one to get all the way up to five, that's, that's not going to work too well, you know, because it's like, watch this. If I'm going from one and I go down, Tell me, when does this negative train end up finally being um, no longer less than or equal to maximum, which is 5? When is this not going to be less than or equal to 5? All these numbers are less than or equal to 5. I'm going to stop before I crash my computer. Stop, 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 stop. Yeah, this is not good. So, while we have this time, I'll go and tell you this. Technically, at some point, this loop will actually end. And you're going to say, oh, does it have like a special condition where it stops the loop after a certain number of times? No. I'm going to come back to our this whenever it's ready. Uh, remember how it, it's ready now? Oh, well, anyway. So you remember how I said in random access memory, it makes an integer of a certain size? Well, I'll tell you this. It makes it an integer with 32, pretend this is 32, um... Uh, uh, zeros. Then let's say we said equal to one, right? Because that's what we did for counter. We said equal to one. All right. Then we decremented it. And what happens is to handle decrementing, it goes to this part and does one because it considers this to be the negative bit. It's actually this bit is actually equal to two is equal to negative two to the thirty second. Thus, it's going to start actually with all these as ones because these are all positives and they make up pretty much everything but 2 to the 32nd. So when you take negative 2 to the 32nd plus all these positive numbers, you end up with a negative 1 in the end. And then when you keep decreasing it, you go down to negative 2 because now we just took one of the positives out of it. And then we go down to uh, negative 3 then to negative 4, and then to negative 5, and then to negative 6, and to negative 7, to negative 8, then to negative 9, then to negative 10, then to negative 11, then to negative 12, then to negative 13. And it keeps going on. Until we finally get to this point where we have 1 and all these zeros, and it's at negative 2 to the 30, it's basically at, it's at negative 2 to the 32nd. Now with all these zeros having slowly moved our way up, finally now it goes 0, and all the rest of these are 1s, right? Because it subtracts 1 more from it, and that's the only way it knows how to do it, is just to make all the rest 1. So this now becomes 2 to the 32nd minus 1. A huge number. This is what's called overflow. So at some point, and that number is actually much bigger than 5. So there is a point where subtracting will actually get us into the positives again, just because uh, programming languages are not perfect. But otherwise, we're going to say it's otherwise an infinite loop that, logically speaking, you will never go from 1 down to 5. So that is the forward loop and got the Java crash. Yeah. That's what I wanted to happen, 54 minutes in. All right, so you can see how that works. Um, I know we said we were going to do string.length, but that's kind of hard to do right now. Oh, wait. Oh, good. It's back. Yeah. All right. So let's do string.length, and for arrays, I feel like you guys are pretty okay on those. Just check the video. Uh, String.length. So here's where I want to say something. For an array, you know that it's an array of something, right? 
Well, here's a little secret for you. You know how strings. Okay. Oh. So you know how strings are words, right? Right. You, you, you understand that. And we know that these are characters, right? Because when I use that care at stuff, I get a character, right? And I use an index, just like an array. Now, this might be the point that if you're not good with uh, arrays, you'd go ahead and watch that arrays video. Okay, welcome back. So, string is actually an array. I know, there's no brackets in front of it, but it is an array. And it's an array of characters. And a long time ago, we didn't really use the string data type because it wasn't in most programming languages. We just made arrays of characters or made character pointers, but we're going to not talk about that ever in this class. That's for C and C++, which while C++ is my favorite programming language, it's not going to be the subject of our conversation today. So let's say we had a word original, because it's like this is what it looks like back in the day. It was actually literally a, uh, a, a, a string of characters, you know, and that was what it was. And it still works today, it's just no point in doing that. You know, if we try to print out, I think, I think it'll work. Try to print out the array. It should print out the um, in the uh, in the, uh, the the actual you know hello. <coughs> Unlike other arrays, character arrays are special, but you don't need to know for AP anyway. Just assume that this would normally print out the address. But anyway. So, you know, it works just like a string does, except it doesn't have all the methods. You know, if I tried to do word original dot care at, so I think it has it. Yeah, it, it won't be able to find it. You would just instead do at one, and then that would go ahead and grab the E for you. Yeah, so we used to do this. So string itself is actually still a lot like that. Uh, while this kind of thing is not allowed, except it is in C++ but not in Java, it, it's basically the same idea, isn't it? Because you have, whoops, I have to actually keep it. Yeah, uh, so uh, it's the same kind of idea as having a character array. Because this is still basically a character array, just what we call abstracted. Because it's way easier to deal with. You know, it's easier to assign it a value. You don't have to do this nonsense. You know, it's easier to assign a value. It's got all these methods to go with it. One of those methods helps us deal with it as it is. So if I were to do i equals that, i is less than word dot length. Now remember, uh, yeah, so you just learned about arrays. So something to know about arrays is that you, you remember that they were dot length without the parentheses. String needs its parentheses. And with this, we can actually do something kind of fun. Um, I don't know how many of you like Vaporwave, but I love Vaporwave music. And a lot of Vaporwave titles, you know, they'll be like, you know, it'll be like, uh, it'll be something like pro Grammy is cool. You know, it'll be like spaced out like that. It's pretty cool. One of the school emails uh, was telling us that our print server was down once, so it said Toshiba is down, and it was spaced out like that. Anyway, side note. So we can actually get that same effect as a vaporwave title for hello right here. Um, just by printing out each character one at a time. And I do that, notice, by saying i equal to zero, because the first index is going to be zero. And I want to stop this when we get to the length of the word. The length of the word hello is five. 
Therefore, the last index is 4. 4 is less than 5 and is the last number that is less than 5. So therefore, we're able to do i equals 0. So we'll print out the character at 0 with a space. Then plus plus incrementing. Remember, we increment it right here. So i equals 1. 1 is less than 5. So print out at 1. And we keep going for all five letters. Hello. Nice vapor wavy kind of type. So that is the um, string length. And that's really, I think, in about an hour's time, that is basically everything we did in class. Sort of. Just at a quicker speed. So go ahead and, uh, if you guys need any, uh, any particular parts focused on a little more, I'm uploading this to YouTube now. If you guys need anything focused on more, send me an email about it and or check out the lectures for those things and uh, or you know talk to me in class but email allows it so that way you can also be programming at home and you want to do that because programming is cool you know what else you know what else is cool to say because I, I hear all the cool youtubers saying it I'm watching make sure to like and subscribe yeah, there we go. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. See ya.